you know, nuclear industry is a big industry, and they have lobbied uh, political bodies wherever these facilities exist to the point where, you know, they've rented a few politicians for for long-term investments, and uh, I think that's probably part of why we're not hearing so much uh, either, is, you know, that's a very, very powerful uh, political lobby, and and the reality of that lobby, um, you know, are are these kinds of, of risks. Now, the other side of that is, you know, and I'm really with you on um, energy uh, resources. We have gas, oil, uh, coal particularly, um, because of some new technologies in that area. You know, coal alone um, could take uh, the U.S. completely out of the energy import business. Uh, Technology that um, one of my colleagues just got back from the CTL, the Coal to Liquids Conference in Paris that took place here about a week and a half, two weeks ago. And, you know, at that conference, um, a U.S.-based company using a, a somewhere just around a billion dollars of Exxon mobile based research in two areas, one in uh, CO2 suppression or uh, recapture, and the other in um, coal to liquids technology that actually yields, uh, get this, 5.3 um, equivalent uh, barrels of jet fuel per ton of coal by adding in uh, some natural gas, which here in Alaska, by the way, we have 2,000 years of known domestic coal supplies and tens of thousands of trillions, with a T, cubic feet of natural gas, 25% of the world's left. And it burns very clean. That's why the yeah. U.N. and the big bankers are on record and the oil companies trying to shut down gas, trying to shut down coal, because right. with the technologies, all that comes out is carbon dioxide and water vapor of the coal. Uh, almost right. nothing comes out from the gas. That's why they're listing it as a toxic waste. Folks, do you want, right. do you want plutonium or uranium blowing up, or do you want some carbon dioxide? Well, here's the thing. This is what this is what's really interesting. Is they use a um, uh, a hybridized uh, blue green algae sur- uh, carbon suppression sink that actually, when you when you net it out on this on the newest technology, what you end up with is half um, the so-called pollutants being generated per uh, unit of fuel, and you get the lowest sulfur content fuel in the world and you get 20 percent more BTUs per unit which means you can get 20 percent more range on a jet aircraft which changes the economics of air transport and this technology works at about fifty dollars a barrel oil and the excess here now this is another bonus is because it produces a, a large amount of heat in the in, in this catalytic process because it's not a coal to gas to liquid this is a coal with a, um, a, a, a chemical catalyst and temperature, and then you end up with 200 to 400 megawatts of excess electric power beyond what you need to run the facility. So it, it really produces a, a net, um, you can actually have a net negative, in other words, be consuming based on the design of these plants so that you don't produce any uh, emissions and you actually net some out. I mean, But, but really doctor, cool. as you know, in our history, carbon dioxide has been 50 you know, 14 times uh, just recently, higher than it is now. Many scientists believe the Earth is actually carbon dioxide starved. I don't think carbon dioxide being released is bad. Well, and here's the thing about all of it. If you look at the carbon cycle over the planet and over its history, as you say, it it has varied dramatically. And, you know, so has conditions on the planet varied over time. And that had very little, in fact, nothing uh, to do with what, what man contributes to the process. But even if you buy into all the arguments, the fact of the matter is, even those guys have to accept coal as a viable alternative to what we're doing now. last week in Business Week, uh, a very conservative business magazine saying that nuclear power is economically almost dead but very sick. And they don't print those, and Wall Street Journal's been saying this too. So. 
The fact is that nuclear power is heavily subsidized by the government and what people may not know is that to enrich uranium, and that's what you put in a nuclear reactor, it's like putting wood in a fire, you put uranium in a reactor, it's extremely energy consuming and uranium enrichment alone in this country uses 3% of all the electricity generated. So you have to take that off, the amount of electricity generated, to get a good figure, an accurate figure. Uh, each nuclear reactor only lasts for about 15 to 30 years and then they become so radioactive that you can't send people in them to operate them because they'll be so irradiated they could get cancer or have deformed children. So then they have to either take them apart by remote control and bury the parts somewhere for a long time, isolated from the environment, or cover them up, up, them up with half a mile of concrete and earth for half a million years and nobody must dig into them because they're terribly dangerous. So that's called decommissioning. That's not taken into the cost of electricity. And massive amounts of very poisonous radioactive waste are produced in reactors. The government hasn't the faintest idea what to do with it. There's just been a national uh, survey done by the Department of Energy asking the public what they should do with the <coughs> nuclear waste. And they don't know. And it has to be stored from the environment for one million years. And a recent survey, survey by the EPA using MIT geologists says that whatever they put this waste in, it's so hot and radioactive, be it glass, ceramics, metal or whatever, will start to disintegrate within 10 years. And it has to be isolated for one million years. Now the cost of this has never been considered in the cost of electricity from nuclear power. when you've got six reactors, even the two they supposedly shut down, including five, smoking, having fires, uh, black smoke pouring out, uh, and clear ongoing meltdowns of the uh, live uranium uh, and plutonium, especially in the number three reactor, uh, this is a recipe for disaster. And uh, unfortunately, many physicists are saying, and, and radiation specialists, that the worst is probably ahead of us. And... Uh, that if those plants have completely melted down one or more, we know a cover-up is then going on. We don't know the extent of how big the cover-up is. There has been partial meltdown, and there could be huge explosions, not just future hydrogen explosions, uh, but there could be a uh, fission chain reaction nuclear explosion that will then project all of that radioactive waste dump that is the Fukushima facility and the live reactors sky high in a uh, massive nuclear chain reaction that will not be pretty and will basically make much of Japan uninhabitable and will turn much of the Pacific into a radiation dump. But there's been a kind of um, stupefied mass apathy cultivated by the uh, establishment media as part of this bizarre campaign uh, to convince the global population that the Fukushima crisis is all but over, uh, when in fact it's deepening day by day. Now, according to the new scientist and the Austrian Central Institute for Meteorology and Geodynamics in Vienna, uh, radiation levels being spewed by Fukushima now rival those emitted by the Chernobyl disaster. And of course, the catastrophe shows no sign of coming to an end. It rumbles on day after day. And these are the headlines. Fukushima nuke plant now in full meltdown. It's melted, the Japanese government admits, completely through the containment uh, steel uh, container, through the concrete, and is now below the facility and uh, boiling through the water table and sending out record levels of radiation uh, is the reports. Fukushima nuke plant now in full meltdown. Reactor number two, we've already seen partial Chernobyl explosions uh, in the aggregate dwarfing Chernobyl, according to many top radiation experts and nuclear physicists. Business Insider, Fukushima, record high levels of radioactive iodine detected in the ocean nearby. Concentrations 3,355 times. The legal limit was identified in seawater sample near the plant. Japan's Nuclear Safety Agency said today this is the highest contamination yet uh, of the radioactive iodine. And, of course, they've been reporting since Sunday, now four days ago, 100,000 times safe levels near the plant uh, of uranium and plutonium.
But now we have the London Guardian headline, Japan may have lost the race to save nuclear reactor. May have lost. They admit it's melted down through the vessel. And so what the mainstream media is reticent to report is the fact that reactor number three, which is the one that was hit, you'll remember, by that massive fireball explosion we saw on March 14th, is the reactor that contains the deadly MOX plutonium uranium mix uh, that is in none of the other reactors uh, there at the site. And so your Geiger counters and your EPA radiation detectors uh, are just not going to pick up this mix of uh, plutonium and uranium. And this is what we'll be talking to Chris Busby about um, later in the show. It's the most deadly form of radiation and it's also invisible to all these detectors that they're using to tell us that everything's going to be okay. Now I wrote an article about this yesterday which you can read. Plutonium is the most deadly radioactive isotope known to man uh, and indeed MOX is two million times more deadly than normal enriched uranium. Uh, the half-life of plutonium-239 is 24,000 years and just a few milligrams of P239 escaping in a smoke plume um, can contaminate soil for tens of thousands of years. Now, this stuff, you know, if this stuff leaks out in significant dosages, you can forget about your potassium iodide. Uh, it's a different monster altogether. But I'm sure, again, that the EPA and the CDC um, will continue to tell Americans that everything's fine and that there's nothing to worry about, just as the children who splashed about in the yellow rain puddles in the days after Chernobyl uh, were told the same thing in Ukraine, Belarus and surrounding countries. Steve Jobs gave a short two-word explanation as to why the app wouldn't see approval. Quote, no interest. Oh, okay, so potassium iodide is completely sold out, exhausted, you can't buy it anywhere. Geiger counters, can't buy them anywhere, they're sold out. But now Steve Jobs is telling us that there's, quote, no interest in an iPhone app that purports to measure radiation. So again, the message is clear, everything is under control. And now US health authorities are actually encouraging people not to take potassium iodide, even in weaker doses. Uh, and even as, as the Fukushima radiation continues to be spewed out of the plant. So 25 years after they told us Chernobyl was harmless, remember the Russians didn't even admit to it until two days later when it, engineers in Sweden measured the radiation. And we've been told that, you know, it, it's of no concern. Don't take your potassium iodide, don't get your Geiger counters. And yet... Uh, in Europe since Chernobyl 25 years ago, we've had nearly mil a million cancer deaths in Europe attributed to the disaster, according to the latest studies. Uh, and in fact, there's a new study that's just been put out by the US National Institutes of Health, the NIH, which states, quote, nearly 25 years after the accident at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant in Ukraine, exposure to radioactive iodine-131 from fallout may be responsible for the thyroid cancers that are still occurring amongst people who lived in the Chernobyl area. But they don't really give a damn about the environment. They're only interested in the environment when they can use it to demonize the likes of carbon dioxide emissions because they know it's the lifeblood of a free and prosperous society. And specifically, I'm talking about George Monbiot, who writes for The Guardian. Now, Monbiot is Britain's foremost eco-control freak. Uh, he's the environmentalist icon for a whole generation of deluded, ignorant leftists who think they're saving Mother Earth by picking up a copy of The Guardian and reading his article. 